Good evening, this is Brother Dave from Rod of Iron Baptist Ministries and Fellowship. This evening I'm going to be preaching a sermon entitled The Roman Catholic Church versus the Book of Romans. The Roman Catholic Church versus the Book of Romans. Now this is going to be a sermon, <laughs> as you can probably tell, that is uh, aimed toward the Catholic Church. And uh, specifically, it's, it's going to be somewhat directed to those of you who are members of that church, who, who identify as Catholic. Um, and let me just say right off the bat, I do not hate Catholics. Uh, I am a former Roman Catholic myself. Um, I don't hate you. I don't even dislike you. In fact, I love talking to Catholics. They're some of my favorite people to talk to because they tend to be the most receptive group of people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just based on the fact that we believe both you as Catholics and myself as a Bible-believing Christian, we believe a lot of the same facts and historical truths of the gospel. Um, but there is a big difference between us two. And I'd like to explain some of that here tonight. And my, my aim is not to offend any of you. I'm just here to preach the truth and to preach the Word of God. And, um, you know, if that happens to be offensive, then so be it. Uh, and any of the brethren who are listening to this sermon, uh, you can all certainly uh, learn some truths as well, I would imagine. Um, and so, as I said, I'm going to be reading out of the Book of Romans tonight. Um, really, I mean, you, I could preach this sermon out of several other books of the Bible, uh, the book of John, or even the book of Acts, for that matter. Uh, but I'm choosing the book of Romans tonight uh, exclusively just, well, because the book of Romans, Roman Catholic Church, I mean, it's easy to remember, right? Um, and I could touch on, since I'm preaching a sermon against the Catholic Church, make no mistake about it, this is what it is, because it's a false church. Um, it is not the Church of Jesus Christ. It is a false church. I'm going to say that right off the bat. But I could touch on any number of things. I mean, when you're preaching against the Catholic Church, uh, we have quite a few things that we can preach against from the Word of God. I mean, the the uh, Mary worship and idolatry, the uh, uh, talismans and the beads, the rosary beads that you that you know, and prayer and and all that and. Uh, the transubstantiation, which is a, a very bizarre doctrine where where the uh, uh, Eucharist becomes supposedly the literal body of Jesus Christ and the wine becomes literally his blood. I mean, it's a very bizarre doctrine. Um, I'm not even going to touch on that, any of that tonight. Uh, or praying to so-called saints when you know, the Bible tells us that uh, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, uh, 1 Timothy 2, uh, 15. I'm not even going to touch any of that tonight. Tonight I'm going to be focusing solely on the doctrine of salvation and why the gospel of the Catholic Church is a false gospel and does not save anyone. I'll say that again. The gospel of the Roman Catholic Church is not a saving gospel. Uh, it does not save anyone. In fact, it will send you to hell if that is what you're trusting in. And I say this only out of love. Because I want you, if you're a Catholic, to be saved. I want you to believe the truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ and be saved. And that is what this sermon will aim to do. And I encourage you, if you're a Catholic listening to this sermon, or if you're a brother and sister in Christ, uh, to grab your Bible, whatever version that might be. I'm going to be reading uh, from the King James Version tonight. Uh, I use exclusively the King James Version of the Bible, um, simply because no other version of the Bible can be trusted 100%, and I believe that the King James Bible can be trusted 100%, and that it is 
completely reliable. Um, but that is a subject for another day. But like I said, Catholic, if you're listening to me this evening, or whenever you happen to be listening to this, grab your Bible, whatever edition or version that may be, and turn, if you would, to the book of Romans, chapter number 3. The book of Romans, chapter number 3. And my hope and prayer to this evening is that you would listen to this with an open heart and with open ears. And don't listen to me. Listen to the Word of God, which I'm going to show you this evening. <clears throat> the book of Romans, chapter number 3. The Apostle Paul tells us, in verse number 10 of Romans chapter 3. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. None of us are righteous. You probably all know that already. I know that is a teaching of the Catholic Church. Like I said, I was Catholic for some time, uh, so I'm pretty familiar with those teachings. <clears throat> verse number 23 of that same chapter, Romans chapter 3. Reads, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you're a Roman Catholic listening to this, I probably don't need to remind you that you're a sinner and that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God, which is exactly what this text is saying. Sin, as we know, is a transgression of the law, uh, God's law specifically. And as the descendants of Adam, we all have a sin nature that we have inherited. And I'm sure this is nothing new to you. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about this. Uh, bottom line is, we're all sinners. Now, what is the solution to that? Well, the Catholic Church will tell you that you need to, and this is in the Catechism, by the way, in the official doctrine of the Catholic Church, you can, if you have an edition of the Catholic Catechism, you can pull that off the shelf as well, or uh, find one at a later time on the internet, perhaps. But according to the Catholic Church, how we are saved, how we go to heaven, because and because we are sinners, we all deserve hell. We know that. But according to the Catholic Church, how you go to heaven how you are justified, how you were saved from your sins and from eternal hell is to, number one, join the Catholic Church. Number two, get baptized into the Catholic Church. Number three, partake in the sacraments, the Eucharist, communion, uh, holy matrimony, if, I, if that you choose to go that route. Um... Holy Orders, serving the Catholic Church, being anointed when you were sick, and lastly, the so-called sacrament of extreme unction, where uh, when you're on your deathbed, a Catholic priest comes and anoints you, and if you pref and oh, confession, of course, every time you sin, you have to confess it to a Catholic priest, and. In, in addition to all those other uh, so-called sacraments that I have just listed. Now, according to the Catholic Church, if you perform all of those so-called sacraments faithfully until your death, you might make it to heaven. And, of course, you have to attend Mass every, every week, every Sunday. And if you do all those things, you might make it to heaven. You might. I mean, you can't know for sure. Uh, they call that the sin of presumption, if you believe that you're going to heaven no matter what. Well, let's see what the Bible has to say. You're in Romans chapter 3 right now. We just read verse number 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's set in stone. There's nothing we can do about that, that we've all sinned. But what does verse number 22 say? Just before that. And let me just say, how do you get to heaven? You have to be righteous. How do you be righteous? How, how can you be righteous enough to get to heaven? How can we do that when we're all sinners? 
verse number 22 of Romans chapter 3. Go ahead and read that. It reads, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. Let me read that again. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. How do you receive the righteousness of God according to the book of Romans chapter number three, which the Catholic Church does affirm as being inspired scripture? By faith in Jesus Christ. To all who believe. That is how you become righteous enough to get to heaven. That is how you receive the righteousness of God. Is by faith in Jesus Christ. Verse number 26 of this chapter reads, To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. That's quite a different statement than what the Catholic Church teaches. They teach that you have to join their church and do all these sacraments and rituals in order to go to heaven. In order to be righteous. In order to be justified. But the Bible here, just in these few verses, says that it's by... Faith, by believing in Jesus Christ. Very interesting. Let's flip over to chapter 4 in that same book, just maybe a page forward in your Bible. Romans chapter number 4, I've preached on this chapter recently in a little miniature Bible study I did. Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible reads, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now again, what does the Catholic Church teach that you need to do in order to have your sins forgiven? Confession, the sacraments, communion, weekly mass. Not so, according to the word of God. For we see that in verse number 3 of Romans 4, if you've got it in front of you, go ahead and read it. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Does it say that Abraham went to a Catholic priest, or went and confessed his sins, or turned from his sins, or took communion, or got baptized? No, it says he believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. Verse number six, David also describes the blessedness of the man, the Bible says, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Now stop and think about that for a minute. You can be totally righteous in the sight of God without works of any kind. Let me ask you something. Is going to Mass every week, is that work? Yes. Is taking communion work? Yes. Is confessing your sins to a Catholic priest work? Yes. Is it work 
to, to join holy orders and, and partake in holy matrimony and pray the rosary? Yes, all of those are works. You might say, well, I've been doing those things my whole life. How dare you insult those practices? Well, we can talk about whether or not those practices are biblical, some of them, the rosary and the Eucharist and so forth, and confession, booth. But the question is, do any of those things save you? And the answer is explicitly, no, they do not. This is Romans chapter 4. Now flip over to chapter number 5. Romans chapter number 5. Just one page forward in your Bible. Romans chapter number 5, beginning in verse 1, the Bible reads, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How are we justified? By faith. By faith in who? The Lord Jesus Christ. His death, his burial, his resurrection. That's what saves us. That is what bought your salvation. You can't pay for it yourself. No matter how good of a Catholic you are, I don't care if you're in Mass every single day and go to confession uh, every time you stub your toe and say a cuss word or whatever, that's not going to get you to heaven. That's not going to save you. We are justified by faith, the Bible says. Faith is synonymous with trust. If you're trusting in that Catholic system to save you, then you are not trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Again, I'm not trying to offend you, but this is the truth. And if that is offensive, then so be it. But this is what the Bible says. Verse number 8 of Romans chapter 5, you're there. Verse number 8 reads, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse number 11 reads, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. What is an atonement? Payment. That's what atonement is. Payment for your sins. Your sins have already been paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. And you receive that gift of a home in heaven and of eternal life through faith in him. Because we keep reading here, verse number 15, just a few verses forward, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through many, through if the offense of one many be dead, much more by the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. The Bible says that salvation is a free gift. Let me ask you something. Do you have to do anything to earn a gift? Do you have to go to church to earn a gift? Do you have to clean up your life or participate in any religious practices or sacraments in order to receive a gift? What is a gift? A gift is free. The Bible calls salvation a free gift. If you have to do anything to earn it, it's not a gift. If I tell you, hey, you can have my Bible, but you have to wash my car and mow my lawn. Oh, and by the way, I can come take it back from you anytime I want to if you're doing something I don't like. Then it's not a gift. That would be something that you earn. It would be a reward. It wouldn't be a gift. And salvation is not a reward. It is a gift, the Bible says. 
chapter number six, the next chapter. Let's look at this. Romans chapter number six, go to verse number 23. And this really sums it up right here. Romans 6, 23, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Does it say that the gift of God is eternal life through the Pope and through the Catholic Church and through receiving all the sacraments? No, because then it wouldn't even be a gift. Okay? It would be something that you earn. It would be a reward. But salvation is a gift. And he says that it is through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we have seen that that gift is applied to you and you receive it through faith. Flip over to Romans chapter number 8. We're almost done here. We're past the halfway point, at least. Romans chapter number 8. Look at verse number 35. At this point, you might be saying, All right, Brother Dave, I, I get it. We're saved. By faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not by the rituals of the Catholic Church, it's not by praying the rosary, it's not by taking communion, it's not by going to Mass, it's a gift, and it's by faith alone. You might be saying, yeah, I get that, but what happens? What if I sin? What if I, what if I don't live the good Christian life that God wants me to? What's going to happen to me then? Do I lose my salvation? Do I go to hell? Well, look at Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. And there's plenty of other verses on this subject as well. Can you lose your salvation? But since we're in the book of Romans, like you look at Romans chapter 8, verse number 35, the Bible reads, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Can anything separate you from the love of God once you've trusted in Jesus Christ? No. No. That's why, look, don't be afraid to leave the Catholic Church like I did, and I never looked back. God blessed me immeasurably for leaving that, that, that fog of confusion those lies that I have been taught. And to answer my previous question, no, you cannot lose your salvation. Because as we just read, it is eternal life from the moment you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your risen Lord and Savior. You receive eternal life. If you could lose it, would it be eternal? No. It would only be temporary. What does eternal mean? It means forever. You believe and you receive eternal life. Life that lasts forever. Meaning that you will never go to hell. You have a home in heaven forever. If you could lose it, then it wouldn't be eternal. It would only be temporary. And that would mean that God lied. But the Bible says elsewhere that God cannot lie. So we know that we cannot lose our salvation once we believe. Flip over to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. 
about to finish up here. Romans chapter number 10. The Bible reads in verse number 4. We're going to start there. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Hey, look. If you are still in that Catholic mindset that you need to keep the commandments and you need to obey the Catholic Church and obey the law of God to go to heaven, then you know what? You better obey all of it. Because that's God's standard if you're going to be saved in that way. Oh, but wait. As we just read in chapter 3, there's none righteous. And in chapter chapter uh, number 3 as well, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So there's no way that you could be saved in that way. It's, it's not possible. Because if you're watching this, as sure as you're born, you have sinned. So it's impossible for you to earn your salvation or to play any role in your salvation. That's why the Bible teaches that we are saved by faith alone. In the Lord Jesus Christ, plus nothing, minus nothing. Because that is when we receive his righteousness, which covers all sin. And we are eternally righteous through that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number 6 of Romans 10. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart... Who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Boy, you know, that's what the Catholic Church teaches regarding communion. That Christ is literally coming down from heaven into the little communion wafer and, and doing the sacrifice all over again. Look, that's blasphemy. That's heresy. Whoever came up with that doctrine is, is frying right now in the lowest part of hell. I can promise you that. Just about guarantee it, in fact. Because that is a, an extremely blasphemous doctrine. Look, Christ's sacrifice on the cross was sufficient. Hebrews uh, says that his sacrifice was once for all. It is finished, Jesus said. Jesus Christ paid for all of your sins on the cross. You can be sure of that because the Bible says so. And he doesn't need to come down from heaven and take the form of a wafer and you need to eat the wafer and drink the wine. No. No. That is a false teaching. Verse number 8. Or, who shall ascend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it? Verse number 8. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith, which we preach. Verse number 9. I want you to pay attention to this. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Does it say that if you join the Catholic Church and do all the sacraments and do X, Y, Z, that you'll be saved? No, it does not. You confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Verse number 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Verse number 13, very short verse. Look at this one. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Does it say that whosoever joins the Catholic Church and takes the sacraments and cleans up their life and goes to confession, does it say that they'll be saved? No. It says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you called upon the name of the Lord? Have you asked Jesus Christ to save you? Through his finished work on the cross? Have you taken that free gift of eternal life? If you've done that, by faith, the Bible says you shall be saved. Not, <clears throat> excuse me, not that you might be saved. Not that you can be saved. But no, you shall be saved. That's a promise from God right there. That whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so in conclusion, if, if you're a Roman Catholic watching this right now, I want you to, well, go to one more verse in Romans, chapter number 11, talking about salvation. Romans chapter 11, verse 6, and this will have, be the final place I have you turn. The Bible reads, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. If you have to do any kind of work to be saved, then it's not of grace, and you're not saved. Let's read the second half of that verse. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. If you're saved by doing works and going to Mass or whatever, cleaning up your life or whatever, then it's not of grace. So look, bottom line is, salvation is either 100% by grace or 100% by works. We're not good enough to earn it 100% by works. None of us are. So don't even try because you've already failed. Salvation, ergo, has to be 100% by grace. What is grace? Undeserved love. God loved us and died for us. Just take the free gift. You say, surely it can't be that easy. No, it really is that easy. The Catholic Church has been lying to you. Okay, they are of Antichrist. They are of the spirit of Antichrist. Having you, you know, call the priest uh, father when Jesus said to call no man your father, Matthew 23. Uh, having you, uh, you know, saying that the Pope is the vicar of Christ. No, my friend, he's the vicar of hell. He doesn't speak for Jesus Christ. The Word of God speaks for Jesus Christ. And so in conclusion, if you're a Catholic, I hope that you've truly learned and gained something from the sermon that I've preached. I, I'm striving to preach the Word of God and make it accessible for those who, who need to hear it and who need to be saved. And now that you've seen just how easy it is, I would invite you to call upon the name of the Lord. Ask Jesus Christ to save you because he already paid for all of your sins. And all you have to do is accept that free gift and you have it eternally. You can't lose it. Even if you went out tomorrow and, you know, committed some horrible sin, Let's say you killed somebody, God forbid, or killed yourself. You still have eternal life. That doesn't end when you do something horrible like that. Okay? Now, God will deal with that kind of thing. But you still have eternal life. You still have a home in heaven. The Catholic Church and the spirit of Antichrist want to control you and to take the place of Jesus Christ. Do not let them do that. If you're in the Catholic Church, I advise you to leave right now. 
join a good Bible-believing, uh, preferably a fundamental Baptist church in your area that uses the King James Bible. And that will make a world of difference in your walk and in your growth. And with that, God bless you and have a good day.